Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are so excited to have uh, Professor Ford with us all the way from California, virtually, for the publication of this new book. I recommend it to everyone. I started it, and it's incredible. Uh, we have the, I will drop the link in the chat if you haven't uh, purchased it yet, but it's also on the events page. So uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. Uh, so today our conversation will include fashion, law, gender, race, class, uh, many different topics and sort of go behind the multi-layered and complex uh, significance and meanings that are behind what, what we wear and that we don't necessarily think about. Um, my name is Melissa Hafaf. I'm the program director for the Gender Justice Initiative. Uh, we are cross uh, campus, cross disciplinary efforts uh, whose mission is to nurture and support uh, intersectional gender justice research programs. Uh, and uh, we are so excited to collaborate with the Women of Color Collective at Jerusalem University Law Center today to uh, bring this program to you. Uh, first, I will introduce our moderator for the conversation, uh, Professor Mezzi, uh, who is uh, one of the many reasons we are here today, actually, because first of all, she is the one who told us about the book and brought uh, Richard back actually to the conversation because we had another event a few years back looking into dress codes at Georgetown where, at the time where we could all gather in a, in a room. Um, and she is also one of the founders, co-founders of the Gender Justice Initiative. So uh, she's one of the few some, I mean, a few people or a small group of people, uh, including faculty and administrators who had a vision to create a space at Georgetown for, to have these kinds of conversations and to nurture research and projects related to gender. Um, so thank you for your tremendous efforts and contribution to, to center and support uh, this work, Naomi. Uh, so Professor Mezzi is also, uh, as I said, a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. She also served as the, as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and uh, was the faculty co-director for the Center for Transnational Legal Studies in London. Uh, professor Mezzi's inter interdisciplinary scholarship helped to create the field of law, culture, and humanities. Her research brings together law and cultural studies to focus on the legal regulation of racial, sexual, gender, and national identities. She also writes on film, visuality, cultural property, maternalism, bisexuality, legal violence, and sovereignty. Her work has been widely anthologized, and uh, she's currently working on a research collaboration on the Me Too movement, uh, which is a collaboration between the Georgetown Massive Data Institute and the Georgetown Gender Justice Initiative. And she is also working on a project, a book project on uh, nationalism and secession with a focus on Catalonia's recent attempt to gain um, independence from Spain. Uh, Professor Mezzi teaches civil procedures, legislation, jurisprudence, gender and sexuality, law and popular culture, um, and nationalism and cultural identity. Uh, thank you so much for being here, both of you. And I will give the mic to you, Professor Mezzi. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. And I, I really am. <laughs> I should have told you to like keep the, keep the introduction of me to two sentences because I'm now going to introduce Professor Ford, and it's going to be shorter. But um, hopefully, the, <laughs> the book will um, actually be the the focus here. And I'm so happy to have Richard Johnson Ford with us today again, uh, back again. Uh, we invited him out, I think, probably um, when he was maybe the beginning or middle stages of this book to talk about dress codes with us. And I am such a huge fan of this project, Rich. Thank you for writing this book. Um, Professor Ford is the George E. Osborne Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. He joined the faculty there in 1994, I think straight out of high school. Um, <laughs> And uh, he's an expert on civil rights, anti-discrimination law, on race, culture, critical geography, and segregation, 
on local government law and now the history of fashion. His scholarly and popular writing um, combines legal analysis with social and cultural theory and critique. Um, in addition to numerous books, amazing books, all of them, um, academic articles, he's also written widely in popular journalistic fora like Washington Post and San Francisco Chronicle, uh, regularly for Slate. And his latest op-ed is in CNN and it is entitled, The Fashion Police Are Judging You on Zoom, which made me extra nervous about this particular event. <laughs> 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 um, so I, I'm so delighted by this book. I'm, I'm not all the way through it yet, but uh, I'm finding it a page turner. And um, I just, I wanted to welcome you. Thank you for being here and really just offer you an opportunity to introdu introduce us to the book and say a little bit about how you, how you came to write it. And then um, hopefully we can just have a conversation from there. And, and I really want to encourage people to drop questions into the Q&A and we'd love to have you be part of this conversation. Well, thanks so much. I thanks everyone for coming to, um, to, to see this conversation on what I understand is the nicest day you've had in months. Um, so I, 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 I really appreciate it, that and I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's especially nice to be um, virtually, at least here at Georgetown, where I gave one of the early versions of this book when it was still in its um, you know, medium stages of development uh, and had a wonderful conversation. And so now that it's complete, it's great to kind of complete the circle and be back. Um, I'll say a few things about why I picked this project, which may seem, and to many people, you know, have, has seemed um, kind of unusual for a law professor. So how did a law professor get interested in something like the history of rules about fashion and self-presentation? So there are a few reasons, um, some professional and some personal. The, the uh, professional reasons, are one, a lot of my academic work has been interested in one way or another in um, what you might call everyday life and the way law affects everyday life and areas of life that are often neglected by um, legal scholars who are concerned with kind of big, weighty, momentous constitutional law issues and things along these lines. Now, those are great um, and they're important, but uh, things that happen on the ground in day-to-day -day life, local government, um, where people's houses are located, and then how they present themselves are of equal importance, but are often neglected. And I'm so I'm interested in exploring those, the relationship between law and culture. I teach anti-discrimination law, and um, I've also taught the civil rights courses, like the, um, our, our course here at Stanford on the 14th Amendment. Um, and it's surprising how many disputes involve dress codes in one way or another. Employment disputes that involve, for instance, women who refuse to wear makeup and are disciplined or fired from their jobs. Um, men who refuse to cut their hair and are disciplined or, in, in, or fired from, for violating workplace dress code. Dress codes that involve religious garb, dress codes that involve hairstyles worn typically by African-Americans and, and especially African-American women. All of these have been the subject of very important um, legal disputes. And so, you know, people are willing to promulgate dress codes and um, spend a lot of time and, and, and effort enforcing them. People are willing to risk losing their jobs or getting kicked out of school or getting disciplined in some way, and in some cases, even legal sanctions um, for violating a dress code. So this is something of profound importance to a great deal of people, but the law typically says it's trivial. You know, in fact, I even have a quote in the book where um, the then um, federal judge who later became associate justice of the Supreme Court, um, John Paul Stevens says, um, obviously dress is just trivial, uh, but we might care about it in this case because of, you know, it tied to some other more weighty issue. And um, so I, I, part of the book was to push back against the idea that dress is trivial and um, to suggest that if we took it more seriously, we would have better um, decision making and better thinking about how to deal with it. So that's the professional. Personal side uh, has to do with, you know, well, I like 
fashion. I'm a little bit of a clothes horse, I have to admit. Um, I got some of this from my father, who was um, one of, was really the only African American in um, in in higher administration when he started teaching at Cal State Fresno in the 1970s, and for whom um, dignified professional attire was not only a way to express his own sense of self, but also in some sense a way to navigate um, environments where uh, you know racial tolerance and, and enlightened attitudes about race were not always on display. And so the importance of that for social justice also became clear to me growing up. And I wanted to spend time um, thinking about that. So the book, I started off thinking about the contemporary moment, but in order to get at why clothing mattered, why fashion mattered, I found myself drawn further and further back into the past. Part of the reason for that was that um, in the past, people were much more likely to speak honestly and openly about the fact that clothing mattered. Um, and one had a nice, rich um, set of rules and laws around fashion that one could refer to. So. Um, I, I kept going back until the late Middle Ages, and part of the reason is because that's the moment when what we might consider to be modern fashion came into existence. New techniques and tailoring allowed clothing to be more expressive, and because clothing became more expressive, because tailored clothing, as opposed to what uh, before that had been the norm, which was draped clothing for both sexes, men and women wore draped clothing, um, but this new tailored clothing allowed for a type of expression that was very quickly picked up on by elites and used as a symbol of power and status. And so when, um, and that, the, 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 if you look at portraiture of, for instance, Queen Elizabeth, I, I'm gonna try to share a slide right now, but my tech savvy may not allow it to work. Um, let's see, ah, okay. So is that, um, can you see it? Okay, I hope you can see it. Um, so great, Queen Elizabeth um, you know, is an example of someone who really understood the power of fashion and used it as a mode of statecraft. Um, and because she did that, she became very concerned about people who were of not of the appropriate status wearing clothing that um, might confuse the message sent. Um, if it's important for the queen to look magnificent in order to exercise authority and get deference from people, it's a problem if the butcher's wife is wearing similar clothing. And so you started to get a whole series of sumptuary laws that became more and more detailed and more and more prevalent from the late Middle Ages through the Renaissance that regulated, clo regulated clothing according to status. Um, uh, only a knight of the garter or above may wear certain colors of silk. Um, you must have a state of a particular size in order to use this amount of fabric in your clothing, all kinds of regulations. Now, they weren't just about social status. They were also very much about gender. They were about religion, but they were um, consistently about making sure that clothing signified something about the individual and punishing and preventing people from wearing clothing that confused that kind of symbolism. Meanwhile, because fashion was expressive and because it was so fun, people wanted to use it in all sorts of new and creative ways. Um, and one of the things that um, emerging social classes, people that were coming into their own with new wealth and power often wanted to do was use fashion for their own purposes. But this was inconsistent with what the elite wanted. And so you got more and more and more dress codes regulating every aspect of attire. And that's a big part of the conversation. Really quickly, I just want to show you an exa a contemporary example. Um, so fast forward hundreds of years, here's the way people dressed in the 1960s in the March on Washington, the civil rights movement. Um, and you'll notice it's not an accident that all of these people have on suits and ties. That was the dress code. Now, it may not have been explicit, but it was very clearly understood that during that moment of social struggle, when people were sitting in, in lunch counters, and I write about this in the book, when they were going on marches, they were dressed in their Sunday best. Um, this was a political statement, but it wasn't the political statement that people often think of as um, 
what we now call the politics of respectability that has a kind of unfortunate or you know, crit crit uh, a critical tone when we talk about the politics of respectability, like people are sucking up to the white man or trying to ingratiate themselves with the power structure. Um, quite the opposite. This was a political statement of uh, defiance and it was an insistence on dignified treatment. We dress in a dignified manner because we demand to be treated with dignity. It's a whole history of rules and laws and regulations that prevented uh, African Americans in particular from dressing above their condition. There was a law in the 1740s in parts of the South um, that uh, outlawed uh, black people and slaves from dressing above their condition. So in that context, in these kind of regulations, both formal and informal continued, um, to right through the late 20th century, this kind of dress was a political statement of defiance. Um, now that didn't stop other people from, uh, indeed a new generation of civil rights activists from dressing differently. So here's an example um, from two years later, but a younger generation. These are members of SNCC, the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, that said, we don't wanna wear Sunday best. We think it's a better approach to uh, social justice to dress in a way that's in solidarity with the people we're organizing. So there's a new aesthetic. And then later, the Black Panthers, yet another. But not, I want what I want to emphasize is that none of this was accidental and it wasn't come as you are. There was a dress code. The Black Panthers had a minister of culture. They cared about self-presentation. It was part of a political program. Black is beautiful as a way to transform and create a new aesthetic. It mattered and it still matters today. Um, Here's last year, Black Lives Matter. And um, these young people made an explicit statement to tie what they were wearing today to what people wore in the past for the civil rights struggle. Um, a, a statement that had profound significance for them. Now, you know, this isn't your grandfather's Sunday best, but it is a Sunday, a version of Sunday best that has symbolic importance. Okay, I could talk a lot more. I mean, there, there's a huge part of the book that's about gender um, and you can see the various ways. I'll just can't resist showing you one. This is um, a group of women wearing trousers, bifurcated girls. So in the, uh, at the turn of the century, the 20th century, a woman wearing pants was bifurcated. She was a bifurcated woman and it was a fetish. It was a sexual fetish. So this whole bad, um, idea was just, they're just women wearing trousers, right? They're not tight. They're not see-through. There's nothing particularly racy about them from our perspective, but the fact that the woman wasn't draped from the dress down um, was a sexual fetish and it could get you arrested in many cities at that period of time. Okay, um, I'll stop there and, um, and um, let's have a conversation. Thanks. Let's see, I'll get out a screen share. That, um, that was, I mean, honestly, you could just keep talking and I think we would all be really happy about it. Um, I wanted to, I actually wanted to talk about, um, the title and the very first inscription. So it's called Dress Codes and, and the inscription is from Prada that says fashion is an instant language. Um, and, and you talk about in the introduction how codes is a, has double significance, right? It denotes both the rules that define dressing um, but also in the sense of being used in the sense of decoding, deciphering the meaning of. And, and that, you know, and then thinking about how you write the book, it's clearly a semiotic history of fashion. And, and I was thinking a lot about the meaning making function of clothing and both individual and social meaning of, of dress and as, as I was reading it. And it actually made me wonder whether it's ever impossible to be silent in one's clothing, right? It's so, um, it's so expressive, um, is it possible not to speak, right? Clearly not by not wearing anything, that's mm -hmm. super, you know, loud. But I, so one was like, can you ever avoid speaking? And what does it mean when you try to? And then sort of wanting you to, to sort of think out loud about this, how the discursive role of clothing you you sort of talk about its discursiveness in the context of status, power, um, uh, sex, 
and personality, I think. But I was, I sort of wanted you to also think about the other layers of meaning that come through a lot in the book about passing and resistance and appropriation and reappropriation and some of the most maybe common forms of our ways of controlling the meaning of clothing. Yeah, wow, that's a great question. And so, um, so many uh, facets to it. So is there ever a way of not communicating? I doubt it. I think people have tried and, you know, there's the old saw that silence speaks volumes, but the attempt, um, you know, there, there, there've been attempts to um, reduce the communicative power of fashion at various points. Like I write about Thomas More. So during the Tudor period where this, this fashion is be, you know, really coming into its own as a symbol of power and status and also personality, um, More in Utopia writes about people who would all wear clothing of the same color, a, you know, a robe in the natural color, no dyes, no ornamentation. That's Utopia for More. Um, but really, it, it's pretty clear that that's a different type of statement. That's why he feels the need to write about it. It symbolizes something in Utopia. And that idea, the idea of the spare, toned down, unassuming, um, becomes a very important fashion statement later in history. Um, as things, when you reach um, the, certainly when you, when you reach the period of the religious Puritans, um, there's a rejection of ornamentation and status on the part of, of, first of all, a small group. But later, that idea matures into what some have called the great masculine renunciation, where men renounce ornamentation and finery in favor of streamlined practical clothing, um, which eventually becomes the business suit. Now, a lot of that clothing, uh, as unassuming as it appeared at the time, actually just moved all of the expensive stuff onto the inside. Um, so you, instead of, you, but the hand, the tailoring and the work that's done in order to construct a suit that does what a suit does is quite elaborate and quite time consuming and quite expensive and recreates all of the status hierarchy in a different form. But now it's all about fit and refined fabrics and drape and things along these lines, this, the stuff of modern tailoring, um, of contemporary tailoring. So I'm not sure, even Mark Zuckerberg's gray t-shirts wind up being a statement. Um, now the statement is, I'm too busy running Facebook to care about what I wear, but he couldn't help um, ascribe moral significance to it because then he goes on to say, if I wasted time on trivial things like what to wear, I wouldn't be doing my job. Uh, and what does that say? And then about somebody who looks fashionable and shows up working at Facebook. Um, and we know the answer because there's a whole conversation in Silicon Valley trashing people who are too fashionable. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure that it's um, possible not to make a statement, but I also think that for the most part, people don't want to, they want to seem as if they're not making a statement, even when they actually are. Um, oh, then there are all the questions about things like appropriation and reappropriation. It's a huge theme that you know, as soon, almost as soon as you get uh, you know, kind of an official dress code, the crown signifies royalty, um, you know, purple signifies aristocratic status, um, you, then you get people reusing it. Um, so Cosimo de' Medici famously says, one can make a gentleman with two yards of red cloth. Um, and that's meant to say, everybody's picking up on this. Um, and you, and so this reappropriation. Now, I think a lot of people read that to say the the, the these um, the commoners, but the wealthy commoners, the merchant classes and stuff, want to pass themselves off as aristocracy, or um, you know, in some way emulate the aristocracy. So it's a, it's a classic case of status emulation. I actually think there's a lot more going on than that. I think what they're really doing is using the communicative power, power of fashion, which now is part of the cultural language of the society in order to assert their own distinctive status. It's not that I'm an aristocrat, it's that wealthy merchants deserve you know, respect and significance as well. And so what starts to emerge is the idea that the average person deserves attention and matters in the same way that it used to be only the high born that mattered. And that's even more challenging to the 
the the status structure because it's bringing it down it's leveling it in some sense um so but you see this kind of appropriation or reappropriation or repurposing really consistently and i think a lot of the reason is that um, in order for clothing to signify, it's got to have some context. It's got so we draw from the past because that's clothing that means something. If I wear something that's familiar from the past, that allows it to communicate. But then if I combine it with some other things, it can communicate in a new way. Um, whereas coming up with something that's completely novel that no one's ever seen before, no one knows what it means. Uh, and so, re, so appropriation in that sense is almost a necessary part of the you know continuing evolution of fashion language. That's so interesting. It's also interesting the way in which this is a it's a what seven hundred year history that you're telling or something, right? And the the ways in which our most salient modern identity categories are still like there's they're there at the inception of fashion regulation norms and coding and they're still there and in a way that shocked me right it's cl primarily class race and gender over and over and over. i mean religion i think to a certain extent is in there but it was fascinating to me that those those are still the primary categories around which dress Re regulation kind of attaches and and I was curious I mean in a way what uh, there's a theme an underlying theme that's sort of the constitutive quality of clothing right or the I don't know that you use the word performative but like it has like mm -hmm. it creates the and informs the self and I, as I kept thinking about the the way in which these modern identities move through historically I was thinking a lot about whether it sounds like the the passing or the appropriation for status purposes is not just I was thinking, oh, is it partly about quelling the anxiety of of moving bound of boundary crossing right mm -hmm. of women dressing like men and vice versa or assuming dressing not according to one station or but you make it sound like it may be more complicated than that. And that it's more than just um, just aspiration, just aspirational, or just passing. And so I'm I'm sort of I'm curious how it is that what we think of as very modern categories end up being present through this whole history. Yes, I I the in, in a sense this project has turned into a history of modernity in a sense a history of modernity but expressed through this very specific thing of rules about clothing and so there 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 what's happening at the same time that you're getting dress codes in expressive fashion are that all sorts of other very modern ideas are coming into existence. There's, you know, the, the, I mean, again, the idea that the average person matters as opposed to just the highborn, which later matures into things like modern psychology um, or the novel, which writes about normal, you know, average people as opposed to epics about great men and great events. Um, that so that those things are all happening. And this, 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 there's a constant tension between the status and the official categories, whether they're about um, you know, social class or religion or sex, um, and this new individuality in which people are saying, I'm not just a member of the commoners that no one should care about. Um, you know, I'm Richard Walwyn, and I'm going to wear, this was one of the characters that appears in my book, but, you know, I'm going to wear these elaborate trunk hose, you know, to show what an interesting person I am, and then he gets arrested um, for wearing outrageous trunk hose contrary to good order. But um, that, or a woman dressing in male clothing, but this is such a consistent part of the history of the evolution of women's fashion is they're borrowing aspects from men's fashion. Um, men are in power, men are the elites. Unsurprisingly, really, um, most of the innovative fashions for hundreds of years were developed first for men, not women. 
Um, and women borrowed elements. Now, at first, it's always a little bit transgressive. It's a little bit racy. Uh, over time, some of those elements become incorporated into women's fashion. But it's a, you know, it's an assertion of individuality. Once again, I'm not just another woman. I'm a certain type of woman. I have my own individuality. Um, and some of that is that I'm going to insist on some of the prerogatives of men. Um, it, you know, so wearing men's clothing as a way of saying, you know, I can stand up for myself. Um, you know, I'm entitled to go out and carouse and drink and whatever, just like men do. Um, and of course, again, that's very threatening to the social order and those women wind up on the wrong side of the law. So in a way, it's also a history. I mean, you could say that the history of fashion is also the history of drag. I mean, like, mm -hmm. is there any difference <laughs> between yeah. fashion and drag in that sense? At least thinking about it through the gendered lens. Yeah. When you were talking about the, the book being a history of modernity made me think a lot of this point, which you write about the emergence of the individual self as being a big sort of historical watershed moment in fashion, right? Where it becomes expressive of individual, the, the, our ability to express ourselves individually. But of course that tension between the individual and the social collective mm -hmm. is one that we're struggling with still now to this day. And it's, and it's, it's interesting to me how it comes out in fashion where you perform for, you, 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 you wear what you wear for one to to convey or express yourself, but you do it because of the meaning it has relative to the readers of you. And then you're also enforced by the collective as to the meaning and the transgressiveness of that dress. And it made me think a lot about, I'm sorry, we have some low flying helicopters. Oh, no. This being Washington, DC. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, um, it made me think a lot about the way in which for some people clothing has double binds. And I was thinking for women and African-American men that, you know, the Madonna whore, like, like the, 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 the double bind of modesty and sexiness mm -hmm. for women uh, of all races and and the kind of preacher punk dichotomy that I that may be operating for African American men in particular, um, and and whether you think of there being double binds in clothing, oh that, yeah, regardless of what we're trying to express. Yes. Absolutely. Lots of double binds. With respect to gender in particular, they're kind of breathtaking and the historical trajectory is quite long. So very early on, for instance, in the, um, you know, in the early Renaissance, you have um, already emerging the idea that fashion is um, one of the tools that um, wanton women use to seduce men and lead them astray that it's the sin of vanity is very much tied to female gender um and and and, and so modesty is a moral and spiritual imperative uh you know the bonfires of the vanities were not just about books and art but also about clothing and jewelry and there's a lot of um a lot of moral regulation around what women should wear. At the same time, women are always expected to be decorative. And so, you know, the requirement that women be decorative, but also the condemnation of women who are, you know, in some sense too decorative is just this ongoing tension that um, you see emerge over and over and over again. Um, it's absolutely a double bind. And even, you know, into the present day, there's, um, uh, you know, one thing I write about in the book, there's a, a woman criticized for being, you know, too sexy. Uh, she's a, um, an archaeologist who's get, doing a presentation on the BBC. And one of the reviewers says, well, um, you know, she's, it's about the Bible. And she says, well, you know, it wouldn't be wrong for me to comment on her appearance. However, um, she looks like one of someone who shimmied out of one of the sexier parts of the Song of Solomon. Um, and then the, um, Another woman historian who's very um, Mary Beard, who's you know not you, kind of the opposite in terms of her self presentation, 
you know, the TV critic says, she looks a mess. Um, you know, she, couldn't she have made an effort? She's on TV after all. So, you know, the, which it's a complete double bind. You can't win as a woman when you have that kind of criticism. Um, yes. And I do, you know, I mean, I think that there are versions of that for race as well. They're not as consistent and they're not as pronounced perhaps, but, um, you know, your preacher punk idea, that's it. I wish I had, I had that phrase. I would have put it in the book um, because it's a nice way to describe um, you know, African Americans dressing in a dignified fashion was denied African Americans for so long that that becomes a sign of, um, you know, of, of defiance and an insistence on, on dignity and dignified treatment is an important type of empowerment. But there's always the risk that it, it, it turns into, um, you know, what, um, what E. Franklin Frazier described in the Black Bourgeoisie is this kind of, um, of, of what you know what we now talk about is the politics of respectability where it's um, trying to distance oneself from the poorer people and ingratiate oneself with the, the you know the bourgeois mainstream um, you know uh, you know at the same time if you don't do that you're, you're you're arguably letting down the race that's one thing you know so a lot a lot of conversation about you know you have an obligation to the, your race to be you know put your, pull yourself together um, and and so that's a it, it, there there are always the potential for these double binds and people work hard to avoid those what stereotypes. Oh shoot, I I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, I muted oh. myself because of the helicopters. Oh um, yeah. So I wanted to interject a a question that came in uh, from a participant from Sophia. Um, says, thank you, Professor Ford, for this book and speaking to us about it. Could you point to any contemporary misinterpretations of historical dress and the cultural implications of such inaccuracy? For example, the erroneous idea held today that Western stays, corsets, were torture devices and tight lacing was the norm and how this is used in a, as a relative marker to say that women today are relatively so much freer from oppression, mm -hmm. patriarchal fashion. In reality, stays corsets are akin to our bras. And so we distance ourselves from people of the past. Is this distance from the past dangerous or useful? Oh, that's great. Yeah, that, what, what a great question. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it can be both, but you're right to point out the danger and, um, the the, you know, the conversation around corsets are really interesting because you know, corsets and high heels are the two forms of women's clothing that are just symbolic of the oppression of women for many people, and so they're always going to be brought up um, as examples of this. But you know, you're right to point out. First of all, corsets started as a garment for men and women, and um, for a you know long period in history, men wore corsets, corsets as well. They were just part of a bracing up of the midsection. Now, it's certainly true that you've got a period in history in which the corset was not only exclusively feminine, but also quite extreme. And it was expressing you, 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 a desire for a particular kind of hourglass shape, which at its extremes what could be quite dangerous. Um, what's also striking is that even at the period of time when tight lacing was at its zenith, uh, it certainly wasn't practiced by most, certainly not all, women. and um, there was already a very well-developed criticism of it, not only from feminists and dress reformers, but a medical critique as well. And um, the critiques of tight lacing very quickly became critiques of women. Um, so what was kind of stunning is the way you know, the, the, the social norm is being attacked in a reformist spirit. It's bad for women to wear these tight laced, tight -laced um, garments, but very quickly it became um, these frivolous, silly women who are willing to endanger their health by, by tight lacing, this just demonstrates how, um, you know, how frivolous and vain women are as, in general. And you got very similar things about high heels. One um, uh, opinion page it said, you know, suffrage, equal rights. First, show me the woman that has the sense to wear a pair of shoes that doesn't hurt, hurt her feet. Then we can talk about equality. So it turns into a, a you know, a misogynistic attack. Um, on women. And I don't think that we've freed ourselves from this in the contemporary moment. It would be um, gross self-congratulations to, to imagine that we don't still do this. You know, in fact, I have an example in the book where just a few years ago, um, a woman 
went to a high tech conference wearing high heels and someone took a picture of her feet and posted it on Instagram um, with the caption, WTF, these shoes, you know, hashtag brains not required. Uh, so uh, it, we haven't come too far um, with respect to that kind of judgment, but it's now couched in the language of practicality and health and sometimes even feminism. Right. So, so in, in the spirit of Sophia's question about contemporary um, allusions to historical kinds of fashion rules, I, one of the things I kept thinking when you, you talk about in the book how red-soled shoes begin in the court of Louis XIV and they were emblematic of that, they, they ha could only be worn by uh, courtiers and, and, and people of the court. And, and I kept thinking, and partly it's just the connotation of red now, of the MAGA hats and the, you know, the red of Republicanism under Donald Trump in particular, and whether you, you know or think it's an allusion to some of the other signification of red. I mean, I know red and blue precedes Trump as, right. po as political symbolism in the United States, but, um, sort of gained force. I mean, my husband literally would not buy a red piece of clothing for the last four years. And so I'm curious what, what, like, if you think of that as historical illusion or speaking to a particular view of politics, right? Monarchical or, mm. or, or something else. Right. Yeah, that that's that's great. That's an interesting question because of course red, so you know, with with this with the heels, um, high heels became a status symbol, and then the heels got higher and higher to be more and more status conscious. So they then became completely divorced from their origins, which were riding shoes um for equestrians. You know, those heels to go into the stirrup. So they started with this kind of masculine military connotation, but by the time you get to Louis the Fourteenth. They're clearly a fashion statement. Red dye was expensive and therefore always associated with the elite. And so painting them red actually revved up and also made them easier um, to see. Uh, it's real. The, the, the connection between that and Christian Louboutin seems to be too obvious to be denied. That um, you know, I can't imagine that's accidental. And um, but you know, with Trump, it's interesting that the big red tie. Are you? I mean, it, I, 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 Trump is, um, the fashion statements coming out of the Trump administration were all surprisingly perhaps literal. They were, you know, so everything was extremely literal. Trump has a big tie because he's, you know, the big man with the biggest tie in the room. And so it's gotta be big and long. And, um, you know, bright red is better yet to draw attention to it. Um, and it's so important to him to have the biggest tie in the room that he's willing to tie it um, in such a way that the short part is, you, you know, the, the back blade is too short and has to be taped down with scotch tape. Um, you know, a big mess. I've got a picture of him in the book with the tie where the wind is blown and you can see the tape. Um, but um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think there is maybe some subconscious relationship between royalty or, or aristocracy and the color red that would make that especially appealing to Trump in the same way, you know, gold, everything needs to be gold. And, um, you know, in the same literalism that leads Melania Trump to when she visits Africa, she's got to wear a pith helmet. You know, it's, you couldn't get more literal than that. Right, I think the only non-obvious, or maybe it was obvious, fashion statement was um, Ivania also wearing the coat. Ask me if I care. There seemed like oh. that that seemed to generate a lot of um, uh, questions from the press. Right. Um, I I want to give you a question from Claire Mulligan. How was writing? How has writing this book made you think about your own personal fashion choices? Oh, um, too much probably, uh, but I, I um, it, it did, I, in, in a few ways, I, I recognize that some of what Naomi and I were talking about earlier in terms of the way African Americans are navigating a certain set of double binds is um, in play. So as a, um, 
uh, you know, as, as African American law professor, a certain degree of um, refined attire seems more important for me than perhaps for some of my white colleagues. And so there's a dressed down aesthetic that's very popular um, in the academy and in California in particular that I don't feel entirely comfortable with. Now, you know, at this point, it's part of my personality. So I wouldn't, you know, it's not strategic in that sense, but I'm sure that it has origins in, you know, the need to, for a certain kind of self-presentation. Um, and, you know, the role of status in all of this and, you know, kind of navigating status. I don't think, I think it's very rare that people can get away from making some kind of status statement with their clothing. And the question is how one does it and whether it, you know, how, how, how explicit it is, how critical, um, but for, uh, um, it's not just for African-Americans, but for just a lot of people that I know um, and, and relate to, they're, you know, a critical or a kind of um, a sardonic relationship to, high, to, to status symbols is the way to inhabit this. Uh, because just dressing down is its own form of status symbol, and it can be more insidious and problematic than dressing up. Uh, besides, dressing up is fun, but um, but you know to have like a relationship to it that's a little bit um, a, a little bit arch, a little bit um, disdainful seems to be a way forward. And I suppose I do that more than I had consciously acknowledged. And the, the writing the book made me think about those kinds of issues. The, the Claire's question made me want to interject one thing. You write a little bit about this in the book, but I also happen to know this about you, which is um, Professor Ford came very close to being a finalist in 2009 for Esquire's Best Dressed Man. And, um, and, and so it's, this is a long, you have a long history of wearing incredibly nice clothing. Um, and, and very beautifully tailored clothing. And it's no accident that the second best dressed academic I know is Norman, your colleague, Norman Spaulding, right? Another oh, yeah. African American man. And so the, um, I think the significance of that you've already talked about. Um, the, the, partly because we're, there's people here not from the law school, but, but a lot of, a lot of people are. And so I wanted to ask you a, a slightly more law related question, um, which is, I was thinking a lot about one of the things that's so appealing about this book is the range of instances and co social contexts and legal contexts in which you see dress codes operating from the most informal to the most formal, from the unspoken and unwritten rules to enacted regulatory regimes. And it made me wonder about the way that the form that different kinds of rules take and how, if you noticed it having an effect on the meaning of the dress in those contexts and the forms of obedience and resistance that are then generated, depending on what the regulation is like from, you know, informal to formal. Because I just, you know, that's a lot of different ways of one enforces different kinds of rules. And so not only how did the enforcement mechanisms match the rules, but what, how did the meanings change because of the form that the rules take? Oh, that's great. Right, right. Really interesting. Um, I mean, yeah, a couple ways. So in the early um, history that I write about where the rules are very explicit and um, and enforced through by um, by force of law. So you have a, a period there was with sumptuary codes, which will just say um, the people of a particular status need to wear X. Um, I, you know, there I think the, the rules have the consequence of reinforcing that meaning, but also of um, encouraging people who are confronted with the rules uh, to you know, repurpose and tweak in various ways. Um, and and you know, because then you've got a clear social meaning and, and then people who say now, um, how can we get away with wearing a crown? 
and and or how can we get away with wearing the thing that the rules um, prohibited and new fashions emerging that refer to the old ones, but you know are different just enough. So you get a lot of that um, where it, you know it, it's copying and transformation. Later in history, where these when these explicit rules are no longer the norm and certainly not enforced by law, but you have lots of etiquette guides. And so the, you know, then, and, and lots of social norms about, um, you know, that are harder to copy because they require lots and lots of savoir faire. So it's not enough to show your high status to wear the right jewels. You have to know when to wear them and how to wear them and not to wear too much. And you, 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 all of this, that you get um, this new transformation where so much is done through subtlety and the subtleties have to get more and more refined and more and more um, more and more surprising, in a sense, in order to keep away the parvenus and the copiers. Um, so, you know, the, then it's the, 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 well, the really elegant woman wears flowers in her hair and not diamonds um, for, to a garden party in the spring. Or, you know, the truly elegant woman would never wear, uh, a, you know, a big you know, gown to church services, uh, but only to the the opera, you know, some things, things like that. And so you get those, you know, kind of a new set of transformations where fashion is always um, you know, you know, evolving in relationship to these kinds of expectations. Um, and then, you know, in the contemporary moment, you still see these kinds of um, dynamics. So, you know, for instance, you get the preppy handbook, which uh, interestingly enough is full of rules about you know, we, this is what preppies do. You know, and the whole idea is that, you know, if you're a preppy, you don't need the rules, you just do it kind of instinctively or you do it because, but, um, but everyone else, you know, you need a rule book this thick to figure out what to wear. Um, and then at the same time, you get, um, you get Ralph Lauren who takes the preppy look and turns and refines it and turns it into a multi uh, national, multi billion dollar industry. And then you get African American rappers who go for polo. Um, and so there's this whole cult of polo among African Americans, which is this new iteration of it. And that that relationship is one that, you know, kind of begins and ends with rules of various kinds, because at each stage along the way, you know, the, when, when the rappers are into polo, they've got really specific ideas about which polo garments, um, and, you know, and which things. It's not just any polo that the is pink going ones, to... right? What's that? The pink ones. Pink, right, pink polos. That's one of the, yeah. You know, so all of that kind of thing. Right. That's, so, so let me, that someone, I think while I was asking this question about different forms that regulations take, um, Rafi Resnick was actually asking something similar, right? Not just the social codes, but when do they become penal codes and, and sanctioning dress choices? Um, and, um, and, and thinking about actors in the courtroom and things like that. But I wanted to ask about the, the so the, the difference between the rules and the enforcement of the rules. And the so one thing that made me start, we can talk about dress in the, course, the courtroom as well. That would be really interesting. But, but one thing you said made me wanna talk a little bit about school dress codes, because one of the, so there's been a, huge increase in public school dress codes. And I think you mention over, well over half of public schools have a strict dress code as of five years ago or something like that. Um, and a lot of the defense of these dress codes are egalitarian and yet the enforcement of these dress codes are deeply inegalitarian. And so I wanted to, think a little bit, this is partly, you know, Rafi asking about criminal codes. Hmm. What, what are those like strongest forms of enforcement for dress and when do, and, and how does that enforcement pair with the intention behind the law? And so it's, that's just a parallel to the question about school dress codes, which I realize are not criminal, but they can have very strong consequences. Yes, yes. And we're talking about it in the contemporary moment. Um, or I was talking about the contemporary moment. Yeah. I was sort of um, riffing off of Rafi's uh, question in about cr 
criminal codes, but I, I, right. that could be any time. Well, yes, I mean, because there are a few criminal laws around dress. That you, you, there are cities that ban, for instance, sagging pants as part of a prohibition against indecent dress. And um, there can be, you, you know, uh, modest but real criminal sanctions for violating those dress codes. Um, you know, for in, until really quite recently. Um, Cross-dressing could be a, you know, it's considered a form of indecent dress and, and criminalized um, in many cities. Now, you know, I, I would say in the contemporary environment, the, the environment, though, the most um, prevalent dress codes with real consequences are workplace dress codes, where, you know, they're not penal, but they are legal in the sense that the employer has the, you, you know, will, has the legal right to discipline and fire somebody for failing to adhere to the dress code. And usually those dress codes are upheld by courts. Um, now then in the public school context, yes, this, this kind of explosion of new dress codes, which seems um, related in some way to anxieties about the, um, the status of public education <clears throat> and the uh, need for pre-professional training. So you know, you're right to say there's an egalitarian motivation, at least in part, which explains in part why um, they're more prevalent at um, less, you know, less, less um, affluent schools, um, you know, because it's pre-professional or it's, it's aspirational in some sense. Um, and then that of course means ironically that poorer students are more likely to have a crackdown about what they wear and what, you know, being sent home and missing out on part of their education because of some strict dress code. There's certainly um, egalitarian with respect to gender where, you know, I mean, at least in some of the cases I looked at, I don't have nationwide data about this, but uh, in, you know, 90% of dress code enforcement in one school was directed at girls. Um, and you know, certainly anecdotally, it's, it's very, very, very lopsided. Um, with that respect. And once again, there's this idea that we're looking out for the girls by making sure that they don't invite sexual predation and by making sure that there's no status competition between the girls, but the consequences that, you, you know, girls are getting, um, getting, getting you know, regulated a, a lot more for, um, you know, in, in many cases for very innocent, um, types of attire and things that would be kind of unpredictable. Um, so yeah, um, so the, the, that kind of enforcement is, you know, it, it's not criminal, but it's legal. Um, and it has, you know, real social consequences. That's where I think you see most of the dress code enforcement in the contemporary environment. Is workplace. And well, workplace and schools, um, but not, you know, the criminal, the criminal law is a relatively small part about it. Although, you know, I do write in the book about the way that dress can become evidence in a criminal trial. So, you know, although it's not direct criminal regulation, it turns out that if you're wearing the wrong clothing, gang related clothing, for instance, then what could be seen as a relatively minor offense can be tied to something that's much more severe. So, you know, in one case I write about tagging a mural um, that was painted by one gang by a rival gang member because he was wearing the clothing that signified his membership in the gang. The prosecutor said, you knew that this would cause um, retaliation. And then when someone died, um, you know, you're criminally liable for the death because what you did set in, you know, inevitably set in motion a chain of events that led to death. Um, and, and that the clothing was evidence that you had to have known you were part of this gang. That's great. Um, I, 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 I know we're, we're just at time, but I wanna ask you one um, last question, if you don't mind, Rich. And, and of course, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's about the pandemic. And, and since you just wrote the op-ed about uh, Zoom, I am honestly curious how you think the pandemic itself, but also virtual school and workplace interactions have not just have changed, but will continue to change fashion. I know there's a lot of talk about, will we return to hard shoes and hard pants? And, and, um, and, and, and I, I, I'm curious sort of both the, 
your assessment of what that looks like now, but your prognosis for where it might take us. Yes, I, uh, so I, I you know, pr predictions a fool's game, but I'm gonna go ahead and make a, 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 a prediction, which is, um, I think you're going to get two opposing trends. One, you've got a lot of athleisure and a lot of, you know, comfy stuff that people are now used to seeing in more professional settings because it's Zoom and there's kind of a sense that it feels a little odd or too affected to dress up and put on you to your full on business attire when everyone knows you're sitting in your living room with Zoom and maybe, you know, the kids are running by getting sodas out of the fridge or something. Um, so there's that. And you've seen this proliferation of kind of high status athleisure where it can still communicate, you know, status and professionalism, but actually it's kind of a sweatshirt. Sure. Um, I, I bet you're going to, that's such a continuation of a trend that started before Zoom or before, I'm sorry, before the pandemic that I expect you're going to see some of that. But um, the, I don't think that's going to be the only story. I think you're going to see a return to a lot of more formal clothing or more um, uncomfortable clothing because people are ready to be out and to care about you know, to be in the social and to present you know to have that mode of self presentation. I think a lot of people miss that. And um, there was just a thing in the New York Times yesterday, kind of talking about uncomfortable clothing and how the author really couldn't wait to put on some clothing that you know was a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but I don't. I think there's really something to it in the sense that. Comfort has a lot of meanings. And we tend to think of comfort, you know, oh, it's soft, it's loose, it's unconstricting, that's comfortable. But psychological comfort and social comfort is in many ways much more important than that kind of physical comfort. And physical constraint, um, the way that clothing disciplines the body is one of its functions. It's not a bug, it's a feature to put it in you know, Silicon Valley type language. That clothing is, and, and in pa past historical periods, it's been quite, explicit. Um, you know, the corset was defended as disciplining the body. Um, the high collared shirt with the tie, you know, was defended as, you know, part of the upright status of the, you know, the, the, the true gentleman. And so it wasn't seen as a bad thing, but as a good thing. And I think there's still some of that, that, you know, the fact that your clothing makes you aware of your body in a particular way or changes your posture is not always bad. Um, and it's the kind of thing that people want more, you know, but when you're on Zoom, it seems a little silly. Um, you know, when you're not on Zoom, you know, maybe it's time to break out that kind of clothing again. I completely buy that, honestly. Just the, the desire to, um, to have a, an audience for one's self-presentation, <laughs> more a fuller audience, like we're all deprived of that. And, um, and, and the disciplining of the body is like the the you know that that sexy quality that you talk about so much in the book you only get from covering and revealing right it requires it requires clothing in order to create the titillation of revelation yes Right, right. There's that's where the drama is. You know, if everything's revealed or everything's concealed, there's no drama. That's that's right. So that is, I, I think that's just a fine place to end. And and but I mostly want to say, um, of course, thank you to the Women of Color Collective for co-sponsoring with us. But um, above all, thank you so much, Rich Ford, for coming and joining us, talking about your book. I cannot um, just recommend this book enough. I'm, it's so much fun to read and, and all of the details are just provocative and cool. So run out and buy it, buy it for your friends and family. And, um, and we need a mechanism by which you can sign these books for us. We need an auto pen or something like that. Oh, right. Well, I could do book plates. There are these things called book plates where you know, you just tape them on or you, you glue them on later, but um, you know they, they look like this. And um, that's what I've been doing in the Zoom era rather than shipping the, the whole book back and forth across the country. I'd be happy to sign some of these if, you know. That would be great. Okay, so so if you, if you, if you show me that you've gotten this book in the next two weeks, I will write to um, 
rich and get some book plates for you. Yes, <laughs> How about that? Yeah, is that? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah, All right, you won't great. regret it. I mean, really, this is for your own good. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. It's really nice to see you. Thank you, it's been great talking with you. Thank you all. Bye. Have a great afternoon. Bye. <laughs>